Hi there, my name is Morgan Wheat and I'm sitting here with Mr. John Schmidt from the class of 1955 and this is the um, just an interview with some of the members of the class of 1955 and an oral history. So Mr. Schmidt, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. It's my pleasure. Yes. So let's start from the beginning. Where did you go to high school? To an Aquinas Institute here in Rochester. All right. And so was there a pressure from the preset Aquinas to come to Fisher, or did you make that decision on your own? Pretty much made it on my own. Yeah. Where did you hear about Fisher? Well, there was a good deal of information about it since about 1948 when they began the whole project. Okay. And the other aspect of it was it would be the only Catholic men's college in the Rochester area. Wow. There was Lemoyne in Syracuse and St. Bonaventure in the Southern Tier. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and uh, this would have been near home. Yeah. And that would have been an advantage for many of us. Yeah. Um, so you picked Fisher because it was close to home. Was there another reason? Well, it was a Catholic college also. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what was your major here? At Fisher. Accounting and finance. Accounting and finance. And what drew you to that field? Basically, my father realized that I would probably only get through four years of college. <laughs> and when I was done with college, I should be able to get a decent job. And he thought accounting would help to be. Yeah. <laughs> that would be aspect of number one of it. Yeah. Um, so he kind of pushed you in that direction towards accounting, or did you always like? I, didn't re I really didn't know that much about it. Yeah. He encouraged me, let's put it that way. There wasn't yeah. any real pressure. Yeah. But I think that's what he would have advised. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't have enough wits to know what else there was to do, so that's what I did. Yeah. My dad's an accountant too, and he was trying to push me in that direction, but as, as we've discussed, my mom was a teacher, so <laughs> she won. Um, so how old were you when you came to Fisher? I was 17. 17? Turned 18 on the 25th of September. Nice. And um, what was your first day like here at Fisher? It's really hard to remember because there were so many days after that. Yeah. But coming in and realizing that the building that we were going to be taught in was not completed. Yeah. Uh, going around the back and coming in through a wooden door, I think it was called the pink door, and that stayed there for quite a while as a landmark for a lot of us because we didn't use the front entrance for a good long time. Wow. And again, I saw a number of my classmates from Aquinas. Hmm. There were also some gentlemen who came from uh, uh, the service. They had been in the Second World War. Okay. And uh, it was kind of interesting to make this group. They started out, I think, about 104 of us. And I think we graduated at 56 or 54, something like that. Yeah. I'm sure the alumni office has much better <laughs> records. <laughs> um, so you said you had classmates from Aquinas. Did any of your close friends join you at Fisher? Yes. Yeah. So that must have been nice. I'm sorry? That must have been nice to it have was. some friends with you. Not only were they friends, it was, uh, we lived fairly close to each other. So that made communication not possible. Yeah. To the best of my knowledge, no more than three students drove a car to here. Wow. We were day hops. <laughs> <laughs> and the Rochester Transit Corporation delivered us out at the intersection. That, that's the main entrance right now. Yeah. But that's how we got back and forth. Wow. How long of a commute was that? Depend on where you live. But yeah. we, I lived in the Rondequart, and I would pick up the East Avenue bus at East Avenue and Main Street in downtown Rochester. Okay. So it could be a fairly decent commute. Wow. Um, so, so you're from um, around Aquai, yes. Aquinas. Was it a a pretty seamless transition to Fisher because you went to a Catholic high school, or was it a, um, a change for you? At first, it didn't seem that awful different. The location and some of the things that we had here, and the, the hopes that you had how it would go, yeah. <coughs> all had a part to play. Yeah. But basically, it wasn't as tough as it could have been. Yeah. One of the station, one of the comments that was made, I think it was in our senior year, is that we were lucky because we were seniors for four years. <laughs> uh, and then we heard that the real problem was you were a freshman for four years. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that was um, kind of interesting for us. We had nobody, and maybe it was a, a problem too, because we had nobody who were senior classmates right. who had been through the grinds and knew the ins and outs and right. whatever seniors could be of help to the uh, other classmen. Right. 
but we survived, most of us, and we had a lot of fun. Yeah. And it was, a, we knew it was a unique experience to open a college. Yeah. I don't think I expected to be here on the 60th anniversary. <laughs> so the building wasn't completed on your first day? No, the original plan was we would occupy a minor seminary that they had closed down in the diocese. Okay. That was near the Kodak office building. Okay. But they decided when they looked at it that it was completed enough that we could have classes here. Okay. The blessing that we received was that we had a very mild winter. Okay. Had we had a bad winter, we'd have had a, a tougher time, I'm sure. Yeah. But the thing we did learn came from watching the people doing the building. Yeah. You had masons who were constructing the cinder walls, the brick block walls, not brick, but cinder block. Okay. You had uh, carpenters because the doors were wooden. Yeah. And you had the metal workers who were, were putting up the frames that the door had hung in. Mm -hmm. And they were all union people. They were all pressuring to get the, most of the jobs they could. Mm -hmm. The advice we received was, don't ever repeat the language you hear in music. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that too was kind of the lighter side of it that we, that we had. Yeah. We did not have an active senior sports program that RIT, U of R, or some yeah. other school may have had. But we had really what we wanted. Uh, we became pretty good friends over the period of time, and some of us have remained that way. Yeah. So uh, going into different fields. Right. I guess the success of the college really kind of measures as to how they made out. And, some of my classmen became doctors, lawyers, right. you name it. They, they got into the professions that they had hoped for. Wow. To me, that was a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> but that comes afterwards. Right. <laughs> when you applied for a job and your first couple of months after you were out of John Fisher, you realized that most people in the community thought it was a seminary. <laughs> they thought you were a priest? Well, that's what they wanted to hint at. I don't, yeah. know, don't know if they ever really wanted to come out and say it. Yeah. But uh, there were some of them that thought it was a surprise that we didn't go into the priesthood. <laughs> Did you become close with the construction workers? Not, or, re not really. No, you didn't communicate with them much? I didn't, know, But they were right around us. Yeah. I mean, we were having classes, and then maybe across the hall they were doing their work. Right. And they did get a lot of it done before the end of the first year, so we had pretty much a completed school by that time for classroom use. Yeah. So, so through, that, through that whole winter, it wasn't completed that whole year. There were window problems, like none. <laughs> yeah, like none. <laughs> well, in some rooms. Yeah. And they used the rooms that were uh, able to be decently used. Yeah. But you knew you got the feeling they were kind of uh, making the best of what they had. Yeah. It was interesting when they put up the tower on the administration mm. building. Wow. The top of the administration building is flat for about, I don't know how many, 16, 18 feet. <laughs> and we went up there to watch him do this. And a group of Native Americans who are very famous for steel work from over the Tonawanda area, I believe, mm -hmm. came in with cranes. And they, we watched them elevate that thing. I think the priests were up there standing there waiting to throw the last rites if somebody fell. Mm -hmm. But they stood on these eye beams that could have been more than eight inches wide and looked like they were walking on Main Street. And they're wow. leaning way over and they're giving them directions and we're standing there with our breath in our mouth. And wow waiting for something to happen, it never did. Yeah. They set that thing up and of course it's still there and uh, everything went the way they knew it would. Yeah. But it was interesting to observe that type of construction work that they, they did all the time. And right. So uh, that was part of the education that wasn't in the syllabus. Right. That's awesome. You got to see the tower, the symbol of our school be yeah. yes. erected. That's awesome. Well, what we saw was the framework for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. That's well, there's a lot of things that we really saw that became part of the school. Uh, yeah. The name of the newspaper at that time, that was the Pioneer. Yeah. We were the Pioneer class. I don't know, are they still using that name? No, now it's, I believe, the Cardinal Courier. Okay, I think I saw that. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Uh, that was the newspaper for a good number of years. The Pioneer. And uh, so we had fun submitting articles and doing things. Yeah. We got to know the faculty on a level I don't think many other levels would because the priests lived here. Yeah. Uh, and they were always available if you really wanted them. Right. 
and in their classes because they all taught. Even the president of the college taught his courses in English. Wow. Marvelous professor, great sense of humor, and uh, just a, a fine person to have where he was. Yeah. He would share with us some of his unique stories as president of a college. And <laughs> they were quite interesting. Yeah. Do you remember any of them? Well, the one that he told that I remember, as best as my memory serves me, yeah. he was talking about the attitude that people would have if they invited you over for dinner, mm -hmm. Mr. or Mrs. from the country club or whomever. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, you would come in, and the first thing they would say would be, oh, well, Father, if you want to freshen up before dinner, you know, the, the restroom was down two doors. And the first thought would be, think I came dirty? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the type of thing that would be there. Uh, there was another one that he said, that they greet you at the door, they don't pay any attention to what they say, anyway, what you say anyway. You know, yeah. Father, how are you? Come on in. Uh, such and such. And he says, I was always tempted to say to them, I'm sorry I'm late, I had trouble stuffing my wife in the furnace. <laughs> she says, I don't think we'd even got a smile or a grin or a nice surprise look. Right. But that's the type of humor he had and he shared it with us. Yeah. And throughout his lectures he would bring out parts of humor of the authors and things of that nature. Wow. And uh, it made a bunch of men a lot more interested in things that they didn't think they would be interested yeah. in, I guess. Exactly. But we did turn out some teachers and professors and people from, from that field also. Wow. So it was a unique experience. There was a classroom, there was a crucifix at the front, on the front of every classroom, which I doubt if that's true today. Uh, no, no. And, uh, but it was basically to be a Catholic school. Yeah. And as it grew, it got to have different needs and different people and different, different students. And I have no objection to that at all. Right. We even have women. Can you imagine? <laughs> How times change. Uh, I guess so. <laughs> the thing that really hurts now <clears throat> is that you look at these students and your first thought is, they're not old enough to be out of high school. What are right. they doing in college? <laughs> I know. I know. But that's... You know, that's what it was. And we, we know, I think now if we look back, that we did have a unique experience. Mm. And uh, uh, for many of us, a very beneficial experience. Yeah. And that's, that's what it was supposed to be. Yeah. So Definitely. both my sons are graduates of John Fisher College. Yeah. So uh, did I talk them into it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> they made the good choice. Um, so how was it going to an all-male school? You must have been used to it if you went to Aquinas. That's right. And the other aspect that made it nice was that there was a place, I think, called McConnell's on East Avenue, really ha almost halfway between Nazareth College and Fisher. Okay. Nazareth College is all girls. We were all boys. We <clears throat> didn't notice the difference from having them in the school. Right. We also didn't have something that I'm not even sure of. I know myself, but there can be a lot of uh, competition between the male students and the female mm -hmm. students, as I've heard people talk, younger people talk about it. Yeah. We obviously didn't have that. <laughs> right. So whether that was a benefit or whether we'd have learned more, I can't say, but <clears throat> I think we didn't suffer from it. Right. I don't remember anybody ever complaining about it. Yeah. What was your relationship with Naz? Would you go down there often? Would the girls come up here? Both. Both. We'd go down there. In my senior year, I married a girl from that, so that tied it up pretty good. Yeah. You were down there a little bit, seeing I her. Was, yes. <laughs> um, and you had dances, right? The two schools yeah. came together for dances? Yes. Yeah. Although we didn't necessarily, we had some dances together, but generally the boys would get whoever they were dating at the time yeah. and come bring down. Okay. Interesting. And there were orchid balls, right? Yes, that was the, like the senior ball, I guess. Like a uh, senior ball. Or, or the fine one of them, but that was the name, the, the big dance. And it was at one of the country clubs, I think the country club of Rochester. Wow. Or no, Oak Hill, that's closer even, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's right down there. Oak Hill, there were those country clubs where we had these dances, which was pretty, pretty nice that they were open to us, yeah. to that aspect. Definitely. Well, some good times. So, so what did you do for fun on the campus besides go to NAS? It's kind of hard to really recall anything yeah. because we weren't here that much. Right. There was no, you know, we would come in for our classes and generally go home or go right. to a job because a lot of us were working to our way through college. Right. So uh, <clears throat> you may want somebody with a more vivid 
memories in mind. Uh, there were some small things that that we may do. Sometimes somebody may sit down and play a game of chess or something, but nothing, nothing of any of uh, big that I can recall. Something else may give you a lot more helpful information. Right. I know Mr. Um, Joe Palvino was talking about intramural sports, uh, that they played basketball and baseball. Did you ever play any intramural sports? Uh, no, and I don't recall that they had that early on in the school. I know yeah. later on, as we went through, they did. Okay. Um, we did go down to the KFC downtown for our swimming pool. Okay. And I did that for a while. So those types of things, as you jar my memory. <laughs> I, um, I do remember going over and dressing for a foot intramural football game of some kind. And I don't remember what it was, but the football never went very far. <laughs> <laughs> um. We were talking about um, how this is a Catholic institution, how it was. Um, Father Murphy, when the school opened, I was looking at some old newspapers, and Father Murphy stated that all faiths were welcome here. Yes. Um, did you have people of multiple faiths, or was it primarily um, Catholic? I believe it was primarily Catholic, but we wouldn't have made a fuss about it anyway. Right. I mean, there was uh, somebody was different, it was different. I mean, there were, most of them took the theology courses anyway and all the philosophy courses. Right. So we, I can't say if there were any or there were not any, I yeah. don't know. It wasn't a big deal. It, it was, was not a big deal. It yeah. was not a closed uh, school. Yeah. Um, so the Fisher faculty was mainly priests, correct? At that time, it was certainly priests, but one of the things that made Fisher special was that they went out and hired laymen, lay women, mm -hmm. in the, f the uh, secular field. Okay. So we had somebody like John Lomenzo, who eventually became Attorney General, I think, of the state of New York, yeah. uh, who was an excellent teacher. Yeah. And he brought with him, as you looked at like our business law book and stuff like that, he could bring experience for something similar to what you were studying, but gave a whole new slant on how the law worked. Yeah. We had him for accounting, we had him for other chemistry, some of the other, most of the other fields where people were, where we didn't have the degrees among the priests, they went out and got people who had practical, good experience and who, who could basically teach yeah. what we wanted. Yeah. And that was a big help to the school, I'm sure. I'm sure it is even today. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. I think of my own department, the education department, they all were teachers. And it's just, they can take their practical knowledge yeah. as they did and apply it to you. And well, that's, that's the way we had in the, in the yeah. real chemistry. All those things were, yeah. we had some great, great men who became friends of the students. And there weren't that many of us. Yeah. So, and then another thing was that as we became sophomores, there was a freshman class behind us. Right. And many of our classes were mixed. Mm. So we know some of the second and third year students as well as we knew our own class. Yeah. So that's another different situation you may have in the, today. Right, <coughs> right. So you, were you pretty close with the professors then, um, yeah, personally? Re really, yeah, some yeah. of us we were. Father Pendergast was a great priest. Yeah. And he knew all the girlfriends. So if somebody came or went to a dance and he told the guy, you know, that wasn't the girl you had at the last <laughs> dance, was it? Did I meet her? I mean, that's just the kind of person he was, not yeah. insin insulting not insinuating anything, yeah. just letting him know that he was aware of who he was and, and what his uh, uh, preferences were and, and right. things of that nature. Right. And he was a true friend. He was a good friend. He was a good man. He taught economics, I believe, in the beginning years, maybe, an introduction to some of the other courses, like accounting or something. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> then they went out and got CPAs to come in and teach accounting and things of that nature. Wow. And it made a difference. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Palvino was talking about a bar that was on, I think it's on East Avenue. Did Maplewood? You? Yeah, Maplewood, <laughs> yes. Did you ever join your professors at Maplewood? I, I Not that often, because yeah. when I left school classes, I had to go to work. Yeah. So that made a difference in my uh, extracurricular activities. Yeah. I knew they were doing it. I know they would come back and they'd talk, but uh, <clears throat> when you have to be someplace else. Right. And uh, that I did not get too involved in that particular extracurricular activity. Yeah. But I know it was a great place for a lot of them. Yeah. Where were you working at the time? <laughs> Strong Memorial Hospital. Yeah. As an orderly. 
Well, for the first couple of years, my dad owned the business. My dad and my family, dad's family owned the business. Okay. They were a bakery, and they delivered house to house. Okay. So the first couple of years, I drove a bakery truck. I didn't get paid because what I earned went towards my tuition. My father saw to that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't regret it. Don't get me wrong. Right. Uh, but I mean, but in by the middle of 1953, freezers were in vogue. Okay. Shopping malls, you know, large shopping centers where supermarkets were in mall, yeah. mall in vogue. Yeah. So on Saturday or whatever day, the m woman in the house would go out and fill up on food, mm -hmm. and she would need somebody delivering bake goods. So the business just uh, kind of went the way of progress. So he yeah. closed the bakery up in 1953, and I was able to get jobs with both Strong and with Genesee Hospital okay. as an orderly. That was an education too. <laughs> so met some wonderful people, yeah. some very hard luck people, very poor, a lot of suffering people. Yeah. But uh, they showed they had a goodness that you didn't find every place. Right. So. That helped me later on as I began to uh, volunteer, and that taught me a lot of things. Some of the um, places in town, Dimitri House is one, and mm -hmm. the uh, Habitat for Humanity is another, and, and you know that type of thing. Right. There are people who can and will do good for other people. They just don't make headlines. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, so was your Fisher education a big part of that too? Did you, you know, do you think your Fisher education helped develop you as a person who was, you know, tried to help others? Oh, I'm sure it did. Yeah. Particularly the, the theology and the uh, philosophy yeah. and studying that, some of that things. Uh, also being in a group of people who were relatively uh, of the same class that you were from. Yeah. Okay. There was no one percenters and no middle. We were all a bunch of guys trying to get a <coughs> excuse me, a college education. Pardon me. Oh, you're fine. Um, was Fisher considered an expensive school at the time, or was it considered more affordable? Yeah, definitely more affordable. More affordable, and you were able to um, work your way in to be able to pay through most of it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so where did the faculty come from? You said some were priests, um, where did, and they'd pick up some laymen, but I know there was one female, correct? There was a female in the um, registrar's office. Zelda Lyons. Zelda Lyons. Did the, the guys know her pretty well? Well, she wasn't that close or connected to the guy. She was kind of a business manager and okay. had to keep a business approach. Okay. It's interesting to look back now, as you talk about 60 years ago, she had the only editing machine in the whole school. Yeah. I don't even remember if it was electric or not, but there was no computers, there were no, none of this high class <laughs> communications things that you have now. Right. She was the only woman on the staff of any nature. Now there may, after a while, there may have been some women who came in and set up a a kind of a cafeteria, yeah. <coughs> but that came la in later years. Okay. But uh, Zelda was kind of unique. If she ever got close to any of the students, I don't know. Yeah. Um, she may well have, yeah. but uh, I think very few of them got to really know her, but that's my opinion. And yeah. I may, again, I was in and out so much, I may not have been able to, to catch all of the uh, implications. Right. You're talking about the cafeteria. Um, was there a food service when it first started? Did you were you able to eat on campus at all, or were we you brown bagged it? <laughs> yeah, brought your own lunch. There was one room that was kind of set aside where you could do that. Okay. You just a pick like kind of a place to eat. That's when we didn't go up to my college because that's <laughs> what we did up there. We had lunch with the girls. Gotcha. Um, so, what was your your class size like in your accounting finance field? How could roughly how many accounting majors were there? I'm not certain of the total count, but some classes you'd have 20 students in. Yeah. Others you may have, if you're lucky if you had 14, depending on what their major was. Yeah. The theology and philosophy classes you had more. Right. But again, they didn't try and force everybody 
into a, a huge class that I remember. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. But they, uh, in another way, we got to know who the other people were, other students, because we heard the questions they asked, and we got to see them after class and yeah. things of that nature. So uh, uh, I don't think class size was ever a real problem, at least if it was, it wasn't my field or my background to know. Yeah. Um, for the people who came in behind you, I know now when I came to college, there's a, a new student orientation, and then mm -hmm. there's a freshman seminar to teach us how to get around and how to do things, how this whole college thing works. Did you do any of that for the kids who came behind you, or um, how did that work? If I remember rightly, the second class was smaller than ours, okay. but there was nothing to really do other than have a day of orientation showing them, you know, this is where we are, we use these eight or nine classrooms or whatever yeah. it was, and this is where the library is. We were given a donation of a great many books. Oh, yeah. And I'm sorry to say I don't remember who the donor was, mm -hmm. whether it was Bishop Carney himself or someone. But he was always an interesting person himself because yeah. to us he was the living image of John Fisher. Yeah. And what we liked about him more than anything else, whenever he came out and spoke to us, it was always an auspicious occasion, <laughs> which meant we got a day off after he left. Yeah. <laughs> How often did he come? Several times a year, before the holidays, before Thanksgiving, maybe before Christmas, okay. maybe before Easter. And that's my yeah. rough recollection. Yeah. Wow, that must have been fun. How long did he talk for? Was it a short conference or did he? Generally he said mass and he had the homily. Okay. But he didn't, I don't remember him talking too long. Okay. He was a good speaker. This was his our baby. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it meant a great deal to him. Yeah. But he was off to back us and support us and what we, what we were aiming for. Um, were you required to go to Mass on a weekly basis, or was not, that a personal not choice? Not that I remember. I mean, our rules for the church was you went to church every Sunday. I mean, right. that was it. I don't really recall, but I don't remember people not going. Let's put right. it that way. Right. Again, because such a vast majority of the students were Catholic, I wouldn't have noticed anyway. Right, right. So I know some schools, um, at least today, require, it's a, it's a class almost, you have to go to church, so I wasn't sure, right. um, but you went anyway, because yep. that was, um, yeah. Well, really, what the facilities we had, there was very little else to do. <laughs> right, right. Um, so were your classes mostly a lecture-based, or um, how did they run class? Well, some of them were lecture-based. Um, some of them used more graphics, like the blackboards that they had. Okay. Uh, some of them, it's hard to say what else they wanted to bring in, but they were free to bring in whatever they thought would be of uh, interest to the, to the students in relation to the course that they were taking. Right. But basically most of them were, were lectures and the use of the facilities that were there. Right. We did not have Skype. Right. We, we did not have any of that electronic stuff, so uh, <clears throat> usually our biggest chore was to make sure we read our textbooks so that when he questioned the class, we had some idea what he was talking about. Right. Or she. Right. <clears throat> so it was a, I guess it was more of a challenge than what we realized at the time. We had no experience to measure it against. Right. Right. Was it a, a challenging Curriculum? Did you? Um, was it tough? I would imagine for some of us it was tough. Yeah. I don't think they wanted the uh, reputation to be well. It's an easy, easy school to get through. Right. right. And uh, I think they wanted it to be. They knew that someday their graduates would be out in the field, and they wanted them to be well prepared for wherever they went. Right. And uh, I think that was the attitude that they had. Yeah. Was it tough? Maybe for some. Right. Was it easy? I don't think many of us found it that easy. Right. right. Now, of course, the course you were interested, you may get more involved in, and you make it easy rather than the right. course itself. But, right. but that's you know, those were the good cool old days. <laughs> <laughs> what were most of your assignments? 
basically reading. Sometimes we have, in the accounting classes, for example, we would have a ledger that you would keep, keep the ledger, and uh, there would be uh, some, some bookkeeping, of course, and many accounting and things of that nature. Theology, history, most of that would be reading up on whatever you was advised. Mm -hmm. And we did have a library where we had resources. And um, that was really most of it yeah. that, that I recall. Yeah. Did you have any essays or anything like that with your reading, or was it just a Sometimes reading? you were required to do that type of thing, yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, probably more of the language people may have had it. Yeah. We all had to take a language. Okay. What language did you take? Well, with a name like Schmidt, what else could <laughs> I take? <laughs> it's been interesting. It's been fun to think of it. Yeah. And uh, I had German also over at Aquinas, so I had some poor background. And of course, my <clears throat> my grandmother, whenever she didn't want us to know what we were, she was saying, she talked to my dad in German. <laughs> So it wasn't exactly strange. We'd sit there and laugh because it sounded funny as grandchildren. Yeah. <clears throat> and she would give us a rather stern frown. <laughs> <laughs> but those were, you know, we were living at home and uh, that was a different part of it too. We did yeah. get that aspect of college. Now there were some of us who boarded at a, a home or someplace that made it available to the two out of town students. Okay. But I think by far the majority lived at home. Okay. So. That made life a little different than what college grew up to be, about what this place grew up to be. Right, right. Where was your library located? It must have been in Kearney, right? That was the only building? It was in the second floor of Kearney, okay. the whole front of the building. Okay. And then underneath where the tower is, that was a library tower. Those were all wow. book stacks underneath there. Really? Oh, yeah. Was it pretty big then, or was it pretty small, the library? library was pretty good size. They yeah. had a goodly number of, of books that were given to them. Wow. And uh, I wouldn't give you a guess on a count, right. but they had shelves on that whole front wall, uh, one wall, and then they had a lot of books up in the tower. That went wow. up three or four stories. Wow. And uh, so they had uh, certain books. And of course, the Rondale Library and all the other facilities we have uh, had available to us right. were, were helpful too. So. Did it get pretty narrow up in that tower, <laughs> in the library? <laughs> yeah, but you didn't stay up there. You went up, you got where the book was, and you went up and got it and brought it down. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, let's see. So you are an accounting major, um, but there, for us, we have a core because of our liberal arts. Yes. Um, we have a core, so you had to take a language theology. Um, what else did they have you take? English. English. Um, a science at all or not so much? I got confused here. I know I had one in, uh, in high school. I don't remember taking one in college, but they yeah. don't, as I say, don't quote me. <laughs> <laughs> but they made sure you had your, your liberal arts. Yes, oh yes. Okay. I think the English of course, Father Murphy taught English our first year, and that's how I can be sure of that. <laughs> Father Bob, Bob Flood used to teach, of course, and he was a librarian. Yeah. And a uh, very interesting character. But um, so then the theology, philosophy, and uh, European language. Okay. Um, were you active in any clubs on campus? Again, I didn't have an awful lot of time to be. Right. So I think I played play chess whenever I got a chance. <laughs> Do you remember any of the clubs that were on campus? Not really. No. Um, I know I was looking through some old newspapers the other day, and um, Fisher was advertising night classes and summer classes. Did you ever take any of those? I didn't think they did the very beginning of the school. Yeah. No, maybe by the time there was the third and fourth year they may have, but okay. I never took any night classes. Okay. And no summer classes either? No. no. Okay. I had to earn money to get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, when did school start and stop? We, um, Fisher begins now, I think the day after Labor Day. So we go beginning of September to almost the beginning of May. Was it the same for you guys or? 
Was it I think it started a little later in September and we went longer in May, closer to June. Okay. But that's 60 years ago. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I'm making your reach pretty far back there in your memory. I'm afraid so. <laughs> that's all right. Um, so the Korean War had just ended, correct? Yes. Was there any veterans at Fisher at the time who fought in the Korean War or World War II? There were definitely from World War II. I'm not yeah. certain about the Korean War. Yeah. Were they, were they older then? Well, the one from World War II would yeah. have been. Yeah. And we had some, I don't remember how many, at least three or four, I think, uh, students with us who had worked a year and then came out to Fisher. So okay. they, they earned some funds, I guess, and then they came out to Fisher. So there were some who were a year older than the some of us. Jack Murphy, for example. He graduated in 50 from Aquinas. Okay. We graduated in 51. Gotcha. <clears throat> and I don't know how many others. Uh, how old Jose Torres was from Guam, I'm not certain, but I think he was a little older. Yeah. And there were some others who were um, from the Second World War, and I, I w wouldn't be surprised if some of them had some experience, at least during the Korean War yeah. years. Did the Korean War have any effect, or the Cold War have any effect on life at, at Fisher, at campus? Well, fairly early they established the Reserve Army Training Corps. Mm. And eventually when some of our graduates uh, graduated from college, they put two years into the military because okay. as officers, I think they went in as second lieutenants. Okay. And then they went right into that aspect of the service. Yeah. But that's as close as we got into anything that I'm aware of. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so students today, we're very active and we go to East Rochester and we go to Pittsford a lot just for lunches or ice cream or the bar. Um, I know you worked a lot, but did you ever or did you know of students um, going into the towns? And well, as I mentioned earlier, McConnell's and in, in, in between Nazareth and here. Gotcha. See, most of us didn't have cars. Yeah, we had to walk. So we either walked or uh, bummed a ride or did something. Right. And uh, that made a difference, I think, from going there. Right. <clears throat> uh, not an awful lot of us did much drinking that I know of, but the ones that went down to the Maplewood may have, I have no idea. Yeah. Interesting. Um, you graduated with 58 people. Okay. Were you a very close-knit class or... Um. I think to a certain extent there were groups of us who would probably be closer than other groups, probably okay. based on your major or whatever. Right. But of course, once college was over, everybody dispersed. Right. And, <clears throat> and uh, I'm sure some of them stayed very close, and others we haven't seen in 60-some years, 60 years. Right. But at your time at school, were you a tight-knit group when you were in classes or anything? But, or I don't know if I could identify or, identify or uh, name a tight knit group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the uh, definition would, would make right. it better. You know, some of us who may have gone through high school together. Right. Some of us went through grammar school and high school together. Right. So that may have had a relationship that was different, but I don't think we right. broke up into groups. Yeah. So. Gotcha. And. If they did, I wasn't invited. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, so you lived at home, right, with your family? Yes. Right. And did most people did that? Yeah. Um, do you remember anyone coming from out of town too far? Well, other than Guam. Right. Where did? Uh, do you remember where he lived? Specific? Oh, no. Oh, I, I don't know where he, he lived. Rob Rainer, I think, was there from maybe Bob Rainer or something like that. He came from up by Watertown or something. He okay. lived here. There were maybe three, four that I was aware of. Okay. And they had an apartment or a... I think they uh, had lived in a home that somebody said they had room for one. Okay. Uh, for a student. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, let's see. So... How did Fisher, being the first class, shape you as a person? Made me aware of people. Yeah. The girl that I married my senior year was blind. Mm. 
We had four children together. And uh, it was a very different relationship than anybody I think had. Yeah. But she, she continued to teach me until breast cancer took her away from me. Mm. But uh, that was uh, a different experience. Now, the other thing, too, uh, Father Murphy knew that once the graduating class was out, they knew that I was going to be around town because the others either went into the military or the graduate school or something. Mm -hmm. I was the first one to take on the Alumni Association. Okay. Uh, I had a pad and a pencil, and I, we, I got a typewriter from someplace and sent out letters every once in a while to try and keep in touch. Yeah. But nobody was close that we could do much of anything. Right. Then by the time he had three graduating classes out, he realized that he wanted somebody to do, spend more time on it and okay. be more familiar with what needed to be done. Okay. And I had a family to support by then. So um, I think Dick Capon came in at that point and did that work for a number of years before he moved to Canada. That's where a lot of our pre-faculty came from. The priests came from Canada. Oh, really? <laughs> it's the Congregation of St. Basil, and their headquarters is in Toronto. Oh, cool. So I taught you to pick that up by now from whom else you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say where did they come from, and then you talk to priests, these priests came from Canada. From Canada, Toronto. Um, so where did you go after Fisher? Well, after Fisher, I went to, to I got a job with a bank, okay. uh, security trust. As the family grew, I then got a job. I didn't want to get with a big company. So I went with General Motors for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, after 10 years, they were moving their office. They had a plant here in Rochester where they made the electric motors that went into automobiles. Um, okay. And they moved that over to Detroit because. Okay. and. Uh, no, not Detroit, to Dayton, Ohio. Hmm. And I, we were not able to make the change, so I got a job with a small computer company. Okay. And they went public, and I worked there for 25 years, over 25 years, and eventually retired there from there about 20 years ago. Hmm. That was a great experience, and keeps me involved with computers because the first ones I worked with you yeah, had to feed what they call tab cards, or the, 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 the IBM card. I don't know if you're even familiar with it. No. You used to get a check or anything that came in that the card was about maybe five inches high and nine inches long. It was almost like a very thick paper, not quite a cardboard. Okay. And they would punch square holes into that. Uh, and they were rigidly sent. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to put something on a card, you took a bunch of blank cards and put it in the feeder and fed a card and then typed very much using a typewriter keyboard mm -hmm. and it would punch these holes. And it would start with nothing on the top layer but then all the digits up to nine and then it would come down to low and then we'll get the next, that's how it got the letters and everything else. And it only used 90 spaces across the card. I've, uh, <coughs> My grandson is in the computers, and I gave him some of the cards that I had left, and he was yeah. kind of laughing because the professors always talked about it. Yeah. Now they use tapes, and now they could put my Kindle will hold a thousand books, and I don't think the memory is any bigger than my thumbnail. <laughs> <clears throat> but this, we worked with a giant computer, and I was the finance in the uh, in the company, and uh, we did work with the university. The Rochester Optics Department. Okay. Dr. Bob Hopkins was on the board. And what they did was a gentleman over in Massachusetts, David Gray, was a, a, well, an optical designer for people who made optical instruments. Okay. And somebody made the comment similar to, we could have a zoom lens if we had 10,000 mathematicians working 10,000 years, because there was all that to be done. Yeah. Then he heard about how fast computers worked. So he got to using the computer and he designed his optical design programs on the computer and it took a very big computer. But he didn't want to sell the computer programs, he wanted to do consulting. 
So the company that we had had some people familiar with optics and we had an agreement with him where we would lease to these corporations like Kodak and Xerox and Bausch and Lomb mm -hmm. and others all over the country access to the large computers so they could use his pr program to design some very sophisticated optical service. Gotcha. Eventually, the comp small computers got powerful enough and the people using them got clever enough that they broke down the big program of smaller parts and they began to do them on a smaller computer and they didn't need the giant one anymore. Uh, the other work we did was one of the, well, the president of the company for a good number of years got involved with pharmaceutical companies and they would do analysis of various studies that they had done on their products they were developing. And then we would take the data that they collected and reanalyze it as an independent. And it was our job to see if we came up with the same conclusions that yeah. they did. And there were times we had to tell them we didn't. Yeah. Because you had to be very upfront with that or you could be dragged under the... <laughs> <laughs> and that worked for a while. And then the fellow who was president, he took it with him when he started his own company. And I guess he eventually sold that. Okay. So that's, but that was another need of a big computer. Um, there's still a part of it that's been bought out, but that used to be the analysis of attitude surveys. Mm. Somebody worked for these large companies, they would fill out a survey, and the results would be shown to management. Oh, yeah. The idea being that somebody didn't tell management, oh, how wonderful you are and everything else, but well, how could they improve if, they, if somebody hit some soft spot in how they thought management was communicating? And that aspect of it is still in, in use, but under a different name. Uh, part of it's a different name. It's still called Genesee. I forget what the rest of it is. But that's, uh, that's still going. So I was involved with computations. All I did was the accounting on it, stuff. So. <laughs> Used a program that they all laughed about, COBOL. <laughs> but that's what, I, that's what I did. Yeah. Was the Fisher name, um, did that help? Or the, was the Fisher name recognized for these companies? Or was it hard being from an unknown school, the first class? Well, at the beginning, it was a little difficult. But as years went on and more and more graduates came out from Fisher, and more and more of these graduates <coughs> excuse me, got into their respective fields, yeah. then the, you know, John Fisher was uh, becoming more and more well-known. There wasn't, you didn't have the uh, problems that you may have had or thought you had when you first graduated. Gotcha. So, All right. Well, we're going to wrap up. Is there anything else you would like to add that I didn't ask you? or? I don't think so. I have not regretted a single day of my life that I went to John Fisher. <laughs> I've met some marvelous people, young and old, yeah. and uh, they seem to be proud of the school, too. Yes. So. But thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. And it's a pleasure to meet the oncoming graduates and yes. the work they do. I wish you all the luck in the world. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming to talk to us. Thank you.